What's up, peers, and welcome to Join the Wasabikas, a Bitcoin privacy podcast. And today I'm sitting down with Chill from Plascomat, uh, talking about a magical hardware device uh, that's completely offline uh, and can be used to, well, buy and sell Bitcoin for fiat cash. It's a Bitcoin ATM, a fascinating project. And I love it not just because of its great features and UX, but also because of the philosophy behind it uh, and, and the way that it was built out. Uh, this is closely tied in with uh, Parlanipolis, a great hackerspace in Prague and other cities now. Uh, and uh, by the way, there is a great episode uh, of the HCPP TV, a 50 out, 58 hour live stream that we pulled off at the last year's Hackers Congress. And there I'm also talking with Chill about the Blascomat and you can see it in action there as well uh, in some quite buggy demo. Uh, but yeah, uh, without any further ado, uh, let's thank one more time the creators of the show. That's not just me. Many people built this. Uh, Zaxonet for the edits and Rafi did that too in the past. Uh, Jaeger for the amazing artwork uh, and uh, Nubuntu for the show notes and timestamps. Uh, so thanks a bunch for everyone. Toss us some sats. Uh, through the Breeze wallet, uh, that's also a podcatcher with podcasting 2.0 value for value payments integrated and get yourself upgraded to that network as well. So now, Charles, how are you doing? I'm good. Uh, how are you doing? Oh, very excited to talk to you. And I, I'm always curious for, for anyone who comes on the show on your motivation of like especially free software uh, and when you started to th think and love about this technology and, and way of, of writing new software when, how and when did you get into this mindset this this ethos of uh, writing open source software I, when i was first learning how to uh, do programming i started with web development and i actually started working on an open source uh well semi open source uh forum software called Simple Machines Forum. And actually, uh, bitcointalk.org still uses it, uh, albeit a very weird old version, I think. Uh, but I worked on that maybe more than 12 years ago. I was writing some pretty extensive plugins. And so that was my first experience kind of creating open source and sharing it with real people, people were actually using the stuff that I was creating. So it, was, it, it, I got my first insight into how to develop some kind of product, even if it's just a plugin for an, a forum, uh, how to actually listen to users, their feedback and what they're trying to do. And I think some people still might use it somewhere. Yeah, it's kind of beautiful and scary to know that there are people out there that you don't know who they are, but they're using and relying on your software. And that, that's quite a kind of weird anonymous way of responsibility. It's in the license that there is not so much uh, responsibility on the developer side. Uh, it should, should be used responsibly by whoever is uh, running it. Yeah, that's true, of course. And then why are you interested in Bitcoin? Why do you work on this technology? Ah, well, yeah, it, it first piqued my interest because I like the the ideas behind um well i read the the white paper everybody has that first exposure to bitcoin through, through reading the white paper uh or at least when i when i got into it now it's mostly about price and money but uh, it used to be a bit more about the ideas uh those people still exist uh but i like the idea of freedom being able to let's say contribute to this kind of open landscape of software and people sharing ideas freely and listening to each other arguing disagreeing drama but it was not uh let's say gate kept you you could join the community you could contribute and you didn't have to ask for permission you didn't need to have certain credentials or money or a license you could just do it if you learned enough and you read other people's stuff, their code, their papers, uh, their you know emails. In the case of the cypherpunk mailing list and Bitcoin dev mailing list, you could just follow along the discussion, and eventually you could catch up and learn enough that you could help and you could contribute something back. 
And that was, it was nice. I really liked this idea in the beginning that you could just do stuff and you didn't have to wait for, you know, you didn't have to be part of a company to do it. You could, you could do it on your own. You could make your own group of people to work on a new project. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's fascinating, right? This this free and open nature of Bitcoin, both in the way of how Bitcoin is being built, right, the underlying bits and bolts of the infrastructure, as well as how Bitcoin can be used, right, as uh, as a way to make payments ultimately and and save your money. Yeah. So then, when when did you encounter the the Lightning Network, and what were your initial thoughts on that? Ah, uh, hmm. So I was involved in uh, in Paranipolis in Prague. Uh, for several years uh, and back uh, maybe a few years ago, I think 2018, not sure exactly when, uh, but uh, we, had a, we had a group of people in the basement of Paranipolis in the hackerspace there in the basement. And we, we were doing meetups regularly where we tried to learn new stuff, learn new, new specific technologies, learn about um, like cryptographic primitives or, um, how to build mobile apps, uh, how to do, um, I don't know, decentralized. We tried stuff with IPFS. We tried many different things, different technologies we were interested in. So we would try a different project. And eventually we, we, we noticed lightning network a few years ago. So we, we started to look into it more. We read the papers, uh, we we decided that this thing made sense, that this is the way. Uh, I think, actually, no, it was not 2018. It had to be around SegWit, uh, the whole drama around the, the SegWit 2.0 and or SegWit 2X is what it was, right? The, the, this, I don't want to rehash all the drama there. Uh, I'm very happy that Taproot did not continue this, that it was relatively drama-free and smooth uh, as opposed to the SegWit times. But I remember reading about Lightning Network needing the elimination of the transaction malleability in, and that's what SegWit provided. And it, well, it was one of the benefits. And then that's when we started to look into it a little bit. We didn't really try anything with it until we did the first iteration of uh, a Blescomat app, let's say. It started as an app. Uh, where we, we wanted to make, we wanted some, we wanted a way for people to buy Bitcoin instantly. And the way to do that was not on chain because you'd have to wait for confirmations, of course. So that's why we liked lightning it was this, uh, instant nature of settlement. Uh, and it felt more like the original ideas from the Bitcoin white paper that you, you, you could transact in the real world using Bitcoin. So that, that's what drew us in. We started to really read about these primitives. You know, how do you, how, how does a bi-directional payment channel work? Uh, the game theory behind punishment transactions and all of these different things that you put together to make this new set and second layer network. So yeah, and the rest, we just kept building. Yeah, so let's go a bit deeper in, in all of these aspects, right? So, so for one, that instant nature of uh, you know, Lightning Network. So, uh, how does that actually work with with Plascomet? What is the underlying technologies that you use? Yeah. So, uh, there are some UX problems with Lightning Network. It's not all perfect and magical stuff. Uh, it, it, it's a very nice improvement, and it helps Bitcoin scale by offloading a lot of transactions into these payment channels. But there are some problems. For instance, if person you're trying to transact with doesn't have a payment channel open yet, or if they're funding, uh, in their channels, the balances are not properly distributed in a way, let's say, then you, you can have fa failures to route a payment to them. And you have to be online all the time. If you want to receive or send payments on lightning. And also there was a, a significant friction. If you wanted to receive a lightning payment from, let's say a website, a, an exchange, uh, where you, you have moved some fun into the exchange to do something else. Maybe you want to buy some other, uh, coins. I don't know. That's what people use exchanges for these days. If you want to buy Bitcoin on an exchange, the same exchange, and then withdraw it over the network, 
it's not a very nice user experience if you're just using straight up uh, invoices on Lightning Network. Uh, so an invoice is basically a request to be paid an exact amount of Satoshi. Well, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a significant amount of information, something about maybe one and a half kilobytes. So you absolutely cannot type it. It doesn't make sense to type that out. So you'd have to copy paste. But usually you have a Lightning Network wallet uh, on your phone or in a server somewhere. So what do you do? You log in to your server in order to generate an invoice for the exact amount of Satoshi. You copy that, you paste it into this website that you're logged into, and then they should send you the money over Lightning. That's a very clunky user experience. So there's a solution, one solution at least, that actually works is LNURL. And this is what we first heard about in, I want to say, I think it was at the Lightning Conference, uh, the one organized by Fulmo in the end of 2019, November, I believe. And someone convinced me, uh, Martin Habo, I was talking to him. I was skeptical, but I listened. And I know Habo, and I know that he's a, he's a solid hacker. And so I looked into it a little bit more. And then during the conference, I started to write up to code a uh, Node.js implementation of an LNURL server. Instead of you needing to generate manually an invoice for an exact amount of Satoshi, you would just scan a QR code that contained a URL from the exchange. The, your wallet, which could be on your phone and it has a camera, you scan the QR code. Now your phone will communicate directly with the exchange server and the exchange server will provide the exact amount of Satoshi to your wallet that you, you are trying to withdraw then your wallet will generate an invoice and send that invoice automatically to the server and the server will pay it. So it's a much nicer experience because now you as the end user, all you have to do is scan a simple QR code once and then magic happens and you receive your Satoshi. So with LNURL, you basically communicate the, this invoice uh, back and forth instead of via QR codes, via a HTTPS connection, just like to any other website. Um, so go a bit more into the cool user experience things that are now possible with such a middleman infrastructure. Yes. Uh, so uh, one application is what I described uh, just now, is where you've got some balance. The user, the, let's say me, I'm the user. I have some balance in some service. For example, there are, I think, uh, a few game platforms now that there are game engines also. They're integrating payments. So you can, as a gamer, earn some Satoshi while you play. Maybe they have tournaments. Maybe they just have some very small amount of Satoshi for doing some quest or some thing during the game. But it's, again, in order to avoid this very clunky user experience of me, the user, needing to copy or first generate an invoice with the exact amount of my balance from the service and then copy and paste it into the service, which just that is very annoying uh, and error prone. It's, it's much easier if I can just simply scan this one very simple QR code because it's much shorter, uh, much shorter amount of text, a URL, to a service, it could be maybe 60 characters long instead of, or even 30 characters could be, instead of, you know, an, an, an LN or a Lightning Network invoice, which can be maybe 500 characters. So in, a QR code has to encode that text somehow visually. So the QR code, the more data you try to put into it, it gets very complex and the more difficult to scan an LNURL uh, QR code is much, much simpler, much smaller. So we eliminate a lot of those problems. Plus, webcams are not very uh, good for uh, scanning QR codes generally because the software, especially in these microcontrollers or uh, even Raspberry Pis, they're, they're much sl slower and the cameras are much worse than phones. Most people have very good cameras in their phones, even if they're running a cheap, you know, 50 euro 
Android device, it, it still probably has a much better camera than uh, the typical webcam. So that's, we made this inversion and we switched to using LNURL uh, because of this primarily. It's because we wanted to make as smooth an onboarding experience as possible for the customer. Yeah, I see that right? that UX factor really shows because Blascomat really is toss in a couple of coins, scan a QR code, and you have money. Exactly. <laughs> and it cannot it cannot get much simpler than that. And there's there's a couple more interesting use cases with LNURL. Um that for example, right, you can have one QR code printed out on a piece of paper, right? Uh, and that QR code never changes. But you the server then can interpret requests to this domain URL in different ways, right? For example, always giving out a fresh invoice, right? Uh, or maybe even even you know, different amount invoices, like a lot of things can be programmed here server side, and then represented in the same domain URL QR code. Yes, exactly. For example, one of these, uh, one interesting little detail with uh, the Blascomat ATM is that it isn't online which means it's, so it's completely offline. It, it can run online if you connect it to Wi-Fi, and then it has additional features, but the base mode is offline and it doesn't know anything about exchange rates. It doesn't know how many Satoshis is one Euro today or tomorrow or at any time, because it doesn't, it doesn't communicate with any APIs to get a, an exchange rate. What it does is it just counts money. It just counts fiat coins and bills, and it creates an LNURL that is signed using an HMAC, uh, which is just a cryptographic primitive to, um, we're using HMAC with SHA-256 using shared key between the server, uh, our platform, and the device itself. So the device has the key, the server has the key, and the device creates a signed LNURL and codes that as a QR code. The user, the customer scans this QR code. And in this is basically a URL that has all the information that you need to facilitate the LN payment on behalf of that ATM. So it has the amount in fiat and the uh, fiat currency symbol. So you can program this ATM to use different currencies and some other information like a nonce, which is a random one-time use um, piece of data, random bytes, uh, and then a few other pieces of information like reference phrase, and all of this is in Euro. So the server is waiting to handle requests on behalf of all of its known ATMs. So the customer, let's say me, I scan this QR code, my phone will now talk directly to the platform server. And so the server can verify that this actually, this, this URL came from a real ATM because of this uh, cryptographic signature that is in the URL. So there's no way to tamper with the amount, obviously, otherwise anyone could just see that there's a URL and it has an amount in, in, the, in there in the query string, and they would maybe try to change this, but it won't work because then the signature is wrong. So this is a very uh, obvious and necessary feature to have to prevent people from, you know, getting more money than they actually put into the machine. So without this, without this ability to uh, on the fly, have the server decide what amount of Satoshi that it will, uh, that it's, that it's uh, let's say advertising to the customer's wallet application. Uh, the server tells the wallet how many Satoshis you are able to withdraw, right? So the original concept here of LNURL withdraw specifically was to withdraw a balance from some online account. We use them as one-time, uh, say, redemption URLs. So we expect that the uh, wallet will like, redeem the full amount of Satoshi every time. Yeah, that's that's so fascinating. Right, that the device itself, the, this Blaskomat ATM, you know, it's it's as you say, just a money counter, right, and a signer basically. That's all, and you don't need an internet connection for that, right? And this m makes it super powerful, right? You can be with this device anywhere, basically, completely in the middle of nowhere, and it would still be operational. But of course, right, 
there is a server side that is always online and running. Uh, and then there's the client's mobile phone, uh, which is, of course, also online. And so the, these two entities still have to be online and up and running. But hey, at least this ATM you know, is, is a, a very dumb machine, basically. Yes, exactly. So our philosophy was to reduce things that could break. We want to make sure that for the end user, the customer, the it's basically impossible to do it wrong. You can, but even last summer where uh, you were there and you saw, you witnessed the first functional prototype of the Bleskomat in the wood case. And you, you saw this thing working and it, it onboarded something like 200 people who the vast majority did not already have a wallet application and they had never actually transacted with Bitcoin before. Uh, certainly, I would say 99% of them never used Lightning because that was, even, even last summer, it wasn't so widespread or used much. Uh, and we were recommending the Phoenix wallet because at the time it was uh, the best. And uh, they, they integrated this concept of turbo channels, which was something that also was very interesting for us. And we really wanted this whole experience to involve a wallet that supported turbo channels on Lightning because it enables a, a new user to install a, a wallet application go up to this machine, this ATM, put some coins in, coins, you don't even need whole bills, push a button, scan a QR code, and they instantly receive their Bitcoin from somewhere, magic, and now they can spend it right away. This is not possible with the current generation of legacy Bitcoin ATMs. This is why we call Bluskomat the next generation Bitcoin ATM because it enables Use user experience that is not possible now or wasn't until this. So this is what we wanted the whole experience to be. We, we were tired of users coming to Paranipolis, for example, or uh, when we went to festivals or conferences, we saw so much friction in this initial onboarding for new people that it really turned a lot of people away. But now with Lightning and with these new extra, let's say, protocols such as LNURL, it's really a game changer for what you can build. It's, it's been very nice to see how much innovation has happened even just in the last year. It's amazing. Yes. And it, it, this really showed me that it is possible to have a slick onboarding UX in a fully non-custodial and, and secure way. And especially with that combination of turbo channels, because really a person who, who never heard of Bitcoin orders a coffee and then the barista tells him to download this app and uh, go to this machine, toss in a couple toy coins, scan a QR code, and magically a Lightning service provider opens an actual on-chain Lightning channel to this user's own private keys, right? So completely uh, self-custodial. Uh, and then pushes the amount of sats that he received or, or that he bought just. Uh, um, and now the user can turn around go to a BTC pay server tablet and right, scan this QR code um, uh, of a invoice to pay the merchant. Right? And now again, magically, it, it just works instantly. Uh, but let's go a bit more into these turbo channels. Um, like it's cool that this zero confirmation magic works, but where are the downsides of it? Ah, well, one downside is that, uh, you know, async, the company that is creating the Phoenix wallet application, they are your counterparty. So they are the counterparty for all of their users. And so that is a, a let's say, a systemic risk for uh, the network that there would be so many users who are all, let's say, centralized. I mean, this is a dirty word in this space, but it's not because it's not really centralization so much because they do give you control. You have a seed, uh, just like with other wallet applications on chain, uh, so you are able to back up your own seed. You are able to close these channels and move everything on chain and you can take it all out of that app. And it's, it, it's as good as it can be. I would say the way that async has done it with Phoenix. That's why we really recommend that as the number one, uh, app for, uh, Bluskomat, uh, customers. And there are now 
I don't think there are any other implementations of Turbo Channels in in, in a mobile app yet. I could be wrong. I hope I'm there wrong. Is. There is actually, I think a couple. Um, Breeze Wallet does it too. Uh, and one of the cool benefits is that in Breeze, by default, you are connected to the Breeze uh, Lightning service provider. Same as you are in, in Phoenix, connected to the Async service provider. Right? But the cool thing with Breeze, it's actually a full-fledged LND node with full command line interface. And so you could open a channel to anyone. And it also has a nice graphical user interface connection to, for example, the bid refill lightning service provider. Uh, so here, even though the default is this slick and nice user experience with one cent quote unquote centrally managed uh, lightning service provider, um, there are other options here as well. That's very good. So I hope that this becomes the, let's say, uh, standard model for uh, wallet developer companies. Yes, exactly. Um, so tell us a bit about the process of upgrading from this initial wooden box uh, prototype where the coins and bills were still flying through the cables just into the void of the box uh, to what is now in store for, uh, for this latest version. We've been uh, really for the last year pushing very hard to uh, learn as much as we can about hardware. Uh, we are, me and... Uh, us, we're, uh, you know, software guys. Typically, we didn't have a lot of experience with uh, hardware projects, uh, so we had to learn a lot of stuff. Uh, but we we have, <laughs> and there's still many to learn. But I think we've come a very long way uh, in this time. So now we've got instead of wood, a steel uh, laser cut design. It's uh, smaller than the previous uh, prototype. So it's something about um, maybe 24 centimeters tall or maybe 30. I don't remember exactly off the top of my head, but it's, it's, it's a cute little box. Let's say now it can fit on a desk and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't feel, you know, overbearing as, a, as an item, let's say in, in, a, in the countertop of a food truck or a cafe or bar, it, it would be okay. It doesn't consume a lot of physical space. Uh, it's much more solid than the wood because wood, uh, as we, we discovered pretty quickly, uh, if it gets a little bit moist, it starts to bend and warp and uh, not even mentioning other problems with wood, like uh, can it moldy or something. We didn't have that problem because we didn't really let it get too wet. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it would be very easy to um, break open a, a wood box so that's why we went with steel. It's uh, the current iteration is matte black, the paint finish. Matte black, because everything should be. As everything should be, yes, <laughs> indeed. So uh, we 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 changed the screen from we had a TFT display previously, but the issue is that it was very bright. So we wanted to have something that wasn't so um, like we wanted something that felt a bit more natural in any environment. So it's just something you, you would be okay with leaving there next to your cash register, if you still have one, uh, or next to your, your, I don't know, bar. Like if you have next to a coffee machine uh, in a cafe, it could be there. And it's not something that's it's gonna be ugly. We wanted something that was kind of nice to fit in these different environments. So it's, it's a bit curved. So it looks uh, like a miniature version of one of those old style arcade machines, I think, could be something like this. And uh, yeah, it's very simple from the outside. You've got a button, e-paper display, a, a, uh, the plastic insert for the bill acceptor with uh, its own LED lights, and uh, in input and output holes for the coins. Very simple. Yeah, so that's that's nice, right? A solid steel frame uh, is is great. And you say that there's the small version, but are you also thinking of of something bigger? <laughs> right now, we're trying to iterate on this version, uh, the, the 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 current iteration that you can see some pictures even on our Twitter at Blaskomat. You can see the the process that we've undergone in the last let's say year of. Uh, going from wood, a few different wood versions, uh, to this larger um, Decentruck 
had this uh, larger one with the TFT. It was steel then, but even that, we made it a little bit smaller, a little bit um, more compact, uh, and we had to design a, a mount system for the interior so that you could easily slide out all of the electronics and uh, modify things. Uh, maybe you you might need to replace some components individually. So if if everything is very compact inside, it's impossible for an adult with adult sized hands to do anything there. So you have to be able to slide all of it out, which you can now, and then you can disconnect cables, reconnect, replace different components, clean it, whatever you need to do. So uh, actually there's the big improvement since one year ago is that the money is not lying you know, on the cables anymore. We've got a PCB, which uh, has eliminated most of the cabling which was problematic before. Uh, now it's very clean and much more stable. And there's uh, a cash box for the bills, which has its own lock, as well as a, a separate box for the coils. So now everything has its own space. It's much more organized, compact, and easier to, let's say, service or maintain. Yeah, put the money into boxes. That sounds like a good idea for sure. And a box inside a box, that's even better. Yes, so multiple boxes in boxes. <laughs> so you mentioned that you actually designed your own PCB board. Uh, and I mean, that sounds like a daunting task. Why did you do it and how did it go? Uh, well, we did it because we wanted to eliminate as, as many of the separate components as possible. We, the, if, you, if you go to our uh, some, uh, the GitHub, Samotsari, uh, you can find the Blesskuma DIY project there. Uh, if you want to get a taste for how complex things can be, that doesn't have the uh, bill acceptor. It only has coin acceptor, as well as uh, it. Uh, it's, uh, let's say, using a breadboard, which helps a little bit. But again, you've got all of these different cables that are going to different components. Y you, need, you need an easy way for, let's say, uh, the operator themselves to switch out components or because you need to be able to diagnose when something goes wrong. And if you've got too many cables spliced together, uh, you know, tape or other things uh, or soldering, we very much wanted to avoid soldering. That's why we went with a PCB uh, because it, it just makes the whole build much more stable. And if you move it around, because that's what we expect our customers to do, uh, if they're operating a food truck or going from festival to festival, uh, they they need to move the the box around. And if it's if it's too fragile, for example, if you've got a breadboard in there or if you've just got cables connecting to different components, then it will break eventually. We don't want that. We want it to be able to survive for years, and we don't want the operator to worry about this sort of thing. So everything in one place, one one unit PCB. Uh, it's much easier. Plug and play. You you have a cable with six pins. You plug it into the six pin connector. It's very easy. So it's it's pretty obvious what where things should go, and everything is pretty standard. The connectors, cables, etc. So that if you want to hack onto it, and if you want to hack the machine itself, and you want to extend it, feel free, go for it. So that's our philosophy. We don't want to stop people from experimenting and we want people to feel like they own the thing. Yeah, as it should be, right? it's your hardware. So do with it as you please. Um, but this is interesting, right? Because now this is not just some generic off the shelf part. This is actually something designed to do this, this one part very good. So can you speak a bit more of how you actually designed it and got it printed? Ah, okay. So I am not the most experienced of us. Carlos has been the taking the lead on the PCP design and iteration, which has been really great. He's He's been explaining a few things to me and it's it's really interesting, the, all the, the, the details that you need to be aware of. Um, but if you want some specifics, we're using uh, KiCad, which is an open source software for designing PCBs. And we're iterating on this. It's been taking us much longer than we expected is because when you deal in hardware, the iteration process is much longer. So when you make changes to your, your PCB design files, 
the, the and you you take you export them and you send it to your manufacturer your your the PCB fabrication and assembly it can take two to three weeks just for that a new iteration to come in so it's a long process and you kind of have to hope that you you know the next one is going to work and you you don't have to continue to uh, keep fixing issues but uh, we're, we're very close with the PCB. And uh, I think we actually have an iteration now that uh, is, uh, let's say, working with uh, everything that we need. And the rest is just some minor details, improvements, uh, stability uh, for, um, let's say, overcurrent, undercurrent of different components, um, just overall uh, making it as solid as possible. So I, yeah, for me, I'm not the one who's focused on the uh, PCB part so much. So and uh, I like I ask up because a lot of what you do is is open source, right? The do it yourself kit completely. The the back end server software is out there. Like a, a lot of upstream contributions to different free software projects. Like I, I love that type of approach. But but with hardware, it's always a bit different, right? But for example, this spec of the PCB, like the design itself, uh, is this freely available and open too? That is not. Ah, uh, we. We still need to discuss. We, we haven't uh, sold any Blaskamad ATMs yet, so we don't really want to make everything open at this stage. Uh, we we have been uh, slowly uh, contributing back. For example, you mentioned the uh, Blaskamad server, uh, so it's it's possible for any any one of our customers, someone who buys one of these uh, machines, they can run their own infrastructure, they can run their own server. They don't need us for that. They don't need to use our platform. Our platform has extra features that could make them a bit, uh, let's say, save them some time, make it a bit easier for them to manage their ATM, or if they have multiple ATMs, then it can be nice for them, but they don't need us. They're not locked in. And this is our, this has been our approach. We, we like open source. We want to contribute where it makes sense, uh, but we, we don't want to prevent prevent us from being able to uh, make this sustainable project, we we very much think that it's necessary to make uh, a company is like an engine, right? You you need to build it in a way that it can actually earn money and pay for sure every every cost that it has, otherwise it will cease to function. So we at this stage we we cannot. Uh, open source everything. Otherwise, it, it we're just we will just disappear because then competitors will just take what we've done and then find the cheapest possible manufacturing process. And then, okay, then what? So we would rather, uh, you know, continue with how we've been doing it and make give people tools. You know, the ATM itself is a tool for the operators. We would like to uh, open source the firmware, like the full firmware in a way that would actually be hackable by the owner of the machine. Uh, but we will also take feedback from our customer. We want to, we want to make sure that we're making it, uh, making something that they find useful and that they are comfortable running and operating and help them solve their problem, which is having a tool that lets them onboard people to this thing that they care about called Bitcoin. And that's basically been our, our main focus. Yeah, I would call the Blaskoma a onboarding machine gun, <laughs> almost in a literal sense, just because it's that quick. Um, for sure, very successful. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's interesting to finance free software ventures, right? and especially when hardware components are involved. Um, and I think you're on a great approach and path uh, so far, and I'm eager to see with how uh, you can actually benefit from those free software uh, approaches, you know, specifically with getting bug fixes in and, and you know, getting a lot of user report uh, and security review. Yeah, it's been my experience over the years of doing open source software development that it's very rare that someone will contribute something useful or meaningful back upstream. So we're not really expecting that. We we mostly provide open source because we want we want the community to see that we are uh that we we don't have anything up our sleeve we're not we're not trying to you know uh, take advantage or 
hide anything. We want to give people the tools that they need. So even if this doesn't work out for us, then they at least can continue on using the thing that they bought. Uh, but obviously we want to make this successful because we have other ideas also that we want to fund and build and we don't want to compromise our vision. We want to, we want to be able to stick to that vision. So we don't want to have to take outside funding. We don't want to need to do any weird, um, let's say, uh, business models, you know, involving data. We don't want the data. We don't want to store it. We want to make machines that help you do a thing. And that's it. We, we, we are very focused on uh, freedom for us and for our customers and the people who use our, our software, hardware, everything. So this is focused on this. Make sustainable business overall. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great goal, uh, and it's essential, right? If you want to do anything long term meaningful, uh, so yeah, uh, great choice, I think. Um, and as you said, right, this the backend server of Plaskumat is available, uh, and people can run it. Uh, and this com this understands this uh, the signature of the ATM machine, right? And is this LMP or has an LMP server integrated too? and then makes this payout uh, to whoever requests it. Um, but you also say that you as the company, Blessed uh, um are offering some additional services and uh, that is integrated with the default back, uh, back end infrastructure that you run and operate. Uh, so tell us a bit, like, what are you tinkering on there? What is possible with your backend? Okay. Uh, it's uh, LN URL, not LNP. LNP is a uh, Lightning Network Service Provider. Uh, it's a, a company that's providing lightning payments as a service. Uh, LNURL is the spec that lets you do fun stuff like this LNURL withdraw and the LNURL pay uh, for static QR codes. So yeah, just to be clear. Uh, so the, what we've got are two things. One, we have the open source uh, Blaskumat server project. It is packaged as a Docker image, which people can uh, download and run in their own container. So they can run it in their own cloud infrastructure very easily. Uh, we would also like to make this, this Blaskabot server, the open source server available through Umbrel. And I believe MyNode has something like this also, this kind of app uh, concept. Uh, and I think they also use Docker. So we want to make it as easy as possible for someone who doesn't want to use our platform to spin up their own infrastructure and support their own ATM or multiple ATMs. So the platform itself, the one that we operate is let's say a, a different server. It's, it doesn't use the same code. It uses the same concept, uh, which the, the core concept is handling this digital signature, this cryptographic signature to verify the, the signed URL so that it's, it can know that it came from a, an authorized ATM, authorized device. Uh, and one additional uh, feature that the Blaskomoth server, the open source version does, is that it handles the exchange rate. So you can decide which uh, exchange rate, I believe the uh, currently it's hard coded, the uh, Coinbase API. But it's, it's, it's trivial to replace that with your own. There are many places where you can query the uh, exchange rate for whichever currency that you want to use. So uh, that is the open source Blaskonot server. That's what it does. Uh, the platform, our platform is uh, a bit more complex. It handles, uh, let's say, uh, WebSocket connections for real-time updates of few different configuration options on your ATM or multiple ATMs. Uh, so for example, you could remotely disable or enable your machines. You can in real time see statistics about the transactions that are going through your ATMs and you can uh, change pretty easily from a few different lightning network service providers. We support open node LN pay and LNTX bot, that's a fun one uh, from Fiat Jeff. I think I'm pronouncing his handle correctly, uh, which is very nice because it, it, it's uh, interesting to use this LNTX bot, which is a Telegram bot for, it's a totally custodial solution for Lightning, but it works. And it's a, it's a fun way to demo a Blaskomat ATM. 
is that you can say, look, I have my LNT XBOT wallet here, which pays out to the customer. So I'm going to show you the full experience here. I'm logged in to the Bleskamot platform also on the same phone, and I can show you the perspective of the operator uh, from, you can see the, the LNT XBOT in real time sending transactions, and also you can see them in the platform itself in your in your web browser. Uh, so it's a it's a nice way in in one go to show everything to uh, to a new person. Aha! Uh -huh. So this bless command service that you're running is not a wallet, right? Where where you, uh, you actually hold the Bitcoin and you make the payments uh, to someone? No, we but... do not hold any funds. We merely uh, it it acts as a proxy in a way of basically just facilitating payments. The the operator themselves should have their own. Uh, either Lightning Network Service Provider account from those three that I just mentioned. Uh, also, we support LND. So it's possible to run your own LND and to just provide the macaroon and uh, the TLS certificate to our platform, and it is able to facilitate payments. Okay, that's interesting. Um, but then, of course, right, if you use your own Lightning wallet uh, or the the macaroon that the user provides here to you um is that a full access right to the entire lightning node or how far does the access go uh theoretically you only need uh you you, you can uh, okay so in lnd you they have this concept of baking a macaroon so basically you can create a custom macaroon uh that is uh very fine tuned permissions for your node and we don't need admin it's possible to, let's say, restrict, but it needs to be able to send payments, which is basically all you really care about in terms of permissions, right? If, if the server is able to spend your Bitcoin from your node using this macaroon, then it's, it might as well be admin. Maybe for other things like privacy, it's because you can, you can get additional information out of the node if you have admin, but uh, really, the, the most critical is the money, right? So it's uh, it's something that we need to further uh, discuss and address, uh, especially once we've got more operators. We want to to understand their, let's say, skill level with operating their Lightning node, because it could be worthwhile to uh, find additional ways to secure uh, this uh, communication so that there's some perhaps a, a additional proxy server that sits in between our platform and their node that will, let's say, have a, a more fine-tuned permissions that the Lightning, uh, the LND does not provide. For example, uh, you could limit the amount of Satoshis that it can spend in a day or in an hour or ever. And you can, we recommend to not have too much money in a hot wallet, in a, in the in the Lightning node. So it's really up to each operator to secure their node and to understand the security trade-offs that they're making. Yes, I see. And you know what? In terms of privacy, what other information do I, as a, a Blaskomat user, need to give you uh, as the service provider, uh, like name, address, and such? Uh well, <laughs> in we would like. To we need the address in order to ship the Blescomot. So I don't I don't know if it's really possible to avoid taking certain information like a name and maybe a, an email and phone number, uh, and certainly a shipping address. Uh, but again, we don't want too much information from customers. We would rather just sell the ATMs as a tool, as a box that people use and operate, and and they manage their own funds. They do all of that. And we do our best to secure our platform and to ensure that the information that they give us is not exposed. So some information is unavoidable. You have to, you have to do certain things. Yeah, so I see. But, you know, per se, um, the, the, as you know, what, what you know is, for example, the Lightning node, right? So if, if you connect your own Lightning node, uh, then this is like one identity to, to a Blaskomat user, or of course those custodial wallet providers, right? They're, that also needs to probably be hooked up to some sort of account. 
but yeah, I mean, the, the nice thing is, right, both options are available. Um, if you're a privacy cautious user, well, obviously, you know, run your own servers and host your own infrastructure. Um, but most businesses are happy to be public uh, and, and announce uh, this. So then on the other hand, right, this is a great service uh, for those people who would like to remove the hassle of running their own infrastructure and just get that plug and play experience. Uh, that's for sure great. Yes, exactly. It's, that's why we wanted to provide this other option to the more privacy um, aware or concerned customers. They can run the Bliskamount server themselves if they want. It's a bit more limited. It doesn't have all of the features that the platform does, but will allow you to do what you need to do, which is operate your machine. Yeah, so that is great. Are there any other things that you would like to mention about more of the software side of Blaskuma? Did we miss anything? Uh, well, I think I mentioned that it can be online. So you have some, some uh, like with the, it can be online and connected to the platform. So it's able to detect if it has an internet connection or if the platform, the server itself is online. So yeah, we're generally trying to make, make it such that this, the, the, the whole experience is pretty smooth and seamless and r reduce the uh, pain points. So anything that can go wrong, we try to really give, um, if possible, remove, remove the opportunity for something to go wrong. For example, uh, with the uh, QR code, right? There's no receipt that will, there's no paper receipt out of the machine, but you can take a picture of the QR code. Uh, which is still valid by itself. It's it's a redemption code. So you can just take that uh, picture and you can hold on to it and you can use it at a, at a later time. So you you uh, if the if the customer has a problem, they can just read uh, what we're calling the reference phrase, which are uh, five randomly generated words from the BIP39 uh, word list, which many Bitcoin users are familiar with. So you've got instead of, you know, some random letters and numbers, you've got five words, which are much easier to read over a phone. For example, if you're talking to somebody on a phone, trying to figure out where your, your money is or how to withdraw it, then you can talk to a human and you can in tell them five words pretty easily, and then they can help you solve the problem. Um, I don't know how, if you've had bad experience using Bitcoin ATMs in the past, probably everybody has, if you use more than one, then it can get a little bit uh, nerve wracking when you, when you put money into a machine and then you don't know if you're going to get the money or not at the other side. So it's nice if, um, if it's a, if, if you get at least something, you have a receipt, you have some code, you have some way to reach a real human to solve your problem. So this is what we're focused on to make, make the whole experience as easy as possible for for the operator as well as the end customer. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and again, it shows uh, because even though I had a lot of hassles with different uh, Bitcoin ATMs uh, so far with Blaskomat, uh, well, I mean, the prototype had a couple hassles, but the finished versions now are just incredible. Like they really fill, fulfill a lot of the potential. Yeah. And uh, we have other ideas in, in the pipeline that we would like to focus on. But first, we want to finish this and, and get it out there, get it into the hands of people, see how it works, improve it. And we're going to keep our ears open. And we are all, all ears. We want to hear what people are missing, what they need for real. What, what, what do you want to see that exists, that doesn't exist yet, that would make uh, life easier for these new uh, Bitcoiners that are coming online every day now. Well, you know, as we've seen in, in the very, very early lightning hack days, uh, a Bitcoin lightning beer tap uh, is absolutely essential. Right? But I, I think that entire general idea of having vending machines is is great. Or more specifically, I would like to have like this wall, uh, maybe even refrigerated, right? where you then have a couple uh, a dessert, a cake, a steak or whatever uh, in this box and you scan a QR code and pay and magically the box opens uh, and you can get your, your goods that, that were inside. Uh, so yeah, automated vending machines or secure lock boxes that open when you pay some sats. I think that's very, very interesting. So uh, please build it quick. <laughs> 
Okay. Well, I can't promise quick, but uh, it's, those are cool ideas. And maybe if there's some other people out there and they are inspired, they can uh, hack something up. Um, I don't know. I hope to see some new conferences coming up that are a bit focused on tech, tech side, some hacking side. Hardware hacking would be great. It's always been lacking in this space. People usually focus on software. Yeah, that's true. The hardware hacking is lacking. You heard it here first. <laughs> yes, we need more. Well, awesome. Jill, it was a pleasure talking to you. Uh, tell us one more time, where can the peers find you and, and what's your final pitch for Blescomat? Yes, okay. So uh, you can find us on uh, blescomat.com. Uh, hopefully in the, let's say, during the summer, we will be taking orders soon. Uh, you can put yourself in line and uh, we will handle orders as we're able to because we're still scaling up the manufacturing process and finalizing a few things. Uh, so I would say be your own bank and I look forward to, I don't know, have, seeing, seeing these machines. I want to see them. I like to travel. I want to see them in every, every country when I go. So I, I look forward to stumbling into one by accident somewhere one day. I hope. Yeah. <laughs> hope. Hopefully very soon. That will be a great experience. So Piers, this is the Blaskomat, uh, the lightning ATM that can be completely offline and that has amazing UX, uh, literally toss in coins, scan QR code, and magically you're stacking sats. Uh, it's uh, incredible onboarding UX. If you have a restaurant, a food truck, or any other place where you would like to get paid in Bitcoin, but your customers don't yet have Bitcoin, well, then get yourself in line and get a Blaskomat ATM. Uh, because, well, as I've experienced already with the prototype, uh, it's ridiculous. And now with those more finished up versions, yeah, they're incredibly promising. And I'm very much looking forward uh, to what Jill uh, can do with this venture in the future. So many cool hardware hacks uh, are going to be possible and interesting with the Bitcoin Lightning Network. So, Piers, thank you very much for joining us here today again at the Join the Wasabi Cast podcast and see you on the next show. Bye-bye. Yeah.